Hello everyone, this is General Hand Grenade. Welcome to my home in Prince George, British Columbia. Today's uh, video is going to be on rules. Uh, but specifically, this is uh, rules that, that people are, are misunderstanding. These are easily misunderstood rules by everybody, including me. And uh, I'm going to get to that. I've made a couple mistakes in some of the videos that I made recently, and I'll talk to you about those. But uh, um, I, I want to make a video because we don't have a rule book yet. Like what I have here in front of you are version 2 reference sheets and the version 2 rule book. I'm going to talk to you about that in a bit. But um, uh, um, people are wanting to play the game and, and we do have rules out there. We just don't have the rule book uh, finalized. Um, and so uh, people are just going ahead and playing, but um, there's a couple of rules that they're misunderstanding. Just a few. I mean, most of the rules are pretty straightforward if you if you read the books and the reference sheets, but some of them can be a little harder to grasp, and so we're going to go over those today. Uh, before we do, though, I just want to mention um, we're all stuck inside with this uh, pandemic, this coronavirus, and if you're bored and you need something to do, you want to watch somebody play Global War 1936 to 1945, there's a new YouTuber out there. He's only got one subscriber right now, some dipshit from up in Canada there. Anyway, uh, you can check his channel out. He's from Dixon, Missouri, and is, he's uh, his name is um, the Ozark Outpost. So just type that in, Ozark Outpost in YouTube, and it'll take you to his channel. And he's got a pretty nice setup. Uh, he's playing version 3, and um, like any new player, he's fumbling his way through it, just like I did, and just like you did, and, and uh, <laughs> he's going to get to be a, a better player. Anyway, just check them out. I'll leave, I'll leave a link uh, in the description box of the video. You can go check them out, okay? Anyway, let's get to this rules video that I was talking about. So let's just take a look here. So this is my rule book for uh, version 2, right? And these are all the reference sheets. And there's not much information that's in these reference sheets that's in the rule book. Like, uh, it, they don't cross very much. So it's not like you can just read the rule book and then you're, you're good to go. Or that you can just read the reference sheets and you're good to go. You need to know both. Uh, the way I look at it, though, you see the rule book here. This is the basic rules. This is this is what you need to know. This is like elementary school. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know what I mean? Uh, you learn how to read here. You learn how to add, subtract, divide, uh, multiply. Uh, you, you learn how to form sentences. You learn how to form paragraphs and everything. And then you get over here. This is when you're doing calculus. You know, you're doing algebra. You're, uh, you're writing book reports, you know, like if you didn't know how to spell, if you didn't know how to add and, and subtract, then you're not going to know how to do your book reports and you're not going to know how to do algebra. So um, it, 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 the, the information that's on here, on, on these sheets here, um, some of it's pretty basic, but some of it is just going to confuse you because you need to know what they're talking about. Like say, for instance, the first thing we're gonna talk about is control and alignment. So there's there's alignment right there. Uh, there's neutral, like there's all these terms in there. And all these terms you need to become familiar with because those will trip you up. Like it's easy to um, fumble the difference between control and alignment because they're they're quite this, uh, they're, 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 they're similar, but they're different. But um, they're really, really important, the, the difference between them. But yeah, like it, I, I, um, I encourage you to get to know the rule book really well. This is the old rule book, but when the new rule book comes out, get to know it really well, just so you know, you know, like what, where to go um, to find things. Um, like uh, when it came to Axis and Allies, I got really good at that rule book uh, just because I knew where to find things. So when somebody was, was to ask me a question on my YouTube channel, you know, where, where do you find that? I knew what chapter to go to. I knew what page to go to. I might not have known the the, the specific rule. It might have just been on the tip of my tongue. But I knew exactly where to go or the three or four places to go to get to the to the answer that that person was looking for, right? So get to know your rule book. This is, this is your read and write and arithmetic, this thing right here. Um, and, and not just you, but get everybody to know it because there is so much information in there. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's so tricky and everything. And, and it's not black and white, right? Like some of the information in here is gray. Some of it's purple. It's not all just black and white. 
Um, it's not just one thing or the other. It could be something else. So you need to find out the subtle differences because there's so many subtle differences in this game. Um, like for instance, in, in Axis and Allies with the, with the political situations, you know, like uh, if you attacked uh, Britain and that brings the United States into the war. <laughs> That doesn't necessarily bring the United States into the war. It might bring the United States into the war in, in 1936, but maybe it doesn't. Like it does this instead. And does that bring the United States into the war? And what does that mean if the United States is in the war? Like there's so much more to this game. Uh, it's not just black and white. It, it's, it, <laughs> it's, it's 50 shades of gray without all the sex. Um, so, you know, once, once, you, once you're uh, familiar with all the terms in here, that's when you can, you can really understand these things a lot better. Because each nation has its own stuff, like they have their bonuses, right? Their victory objectives. Now, the victory objectives are in this book as well, but you can just skip over those right there. I mean, you can read through them just to see what it is, but you don't really need to know what these are until you're halfway through a game. Uh, honestly, like they're, they're just, you know, what you need to do to pick up points. So, so don't worry about those too much. You, you, you can get to those later. But uh, all the stuff that, that uh, is about that nation and all the, the special things like the special units and the special abilities, you know, all of these things are on here. Um, all about their political situations is on here, right? Now, in order to understand what those political situation means, you have to read this because this is where it's going to teach you about control and alignment and alliances and things like that. And then once you finish that, then you can understand what Germany means and, and what the Soviet Union um, page means and what all of these pages mean. But uh, you got to do that first, okay? So uh, let's just go to the war room and, and we'll carry on with some of the rules. And magically we have appeared in the war room. So let's start off very, very basic here, okay? Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm not going to go through all the rules. That's going to be when I do a video rulebook. I just want to, to give you a basic understanding of uh, some of the things that I see that are going on online, questions that I'm asked, questions that I see on Facebook, questions that I see on accessandallies.org in the global war section. Just some things that are, are quite often misunderstood, okay? Not tricky rules, just things that, that people don't understand correctly, including me. I don't understand them sometimes, and, and there's reasons for that, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. So, getting a basic understanding. So there's seven, sorry, um, yeah, there's seven major powers in the game, okay? So there's Germany, there's the black guys up there, there's Japan, or sorry, there's Italy, and then there's Japan over there, but most of them are down here, if you can remember my video from yesterday. Um, also, there's, there's the Great Britain up there, there's France, there's the United States, and there's the USSR. Now, you can call it Russia if you want, but it wasn't really called Russia back then. It was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic back during World War II. So that's what the, the seven nations are. Now, those seven nations are broken up into three alliances. One of the alliances is the common term. So that is the Russians, right? But you can also throw these brown guys here in China. Uh, that's the CCP. They're a minor part of uh, a minor power. Like these were major powers up here. That's a minor power that's, that's, uh, um, that, that is controlled by, uh, yeah, sorry. That's a minor power that, that's controlled by the USSR. And over here, there's also these brown guys. I did that on purpose. I, I, I made them the same color. These brown guys are also controlled by the USSR. And then there's the Axis. The Axis are Italy and Germany and Japan, and they have one controlled minor power, and that is the, the Spanish nationalists. So the Spanish nationalists and this, the Republicans in Spain there are fighting a civil war. So it's Germany and, and Russia, or sorry, the USSR that's controlling those two factions, right? And then you have the allies. That's the um, um, the Americans and the British and France. Uh, actually, uh, you, I, I said British, but really it's the Commonwealth because the Commonwealth is uh, Great Britain over there, but it's also the FEC or Far East Command and it's ANZAC over here. So those three uh, uh, factions form the Commonwealth, which, uh, which is controlled by Britain. Uh, they're controlled miners, 
is this one here. This is Abyssinia. That's controlled by France. And, uh, and nationalist China here. That's a minor power as well. Um, the ones where, the, where this symbol is. So those are controlled by the United States. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the major and minor powers in this game. And then there's various other uh, minor, minor, nation, minor powers in this game. Like all these other ones that you, where you see roundels and everything. Those are, um, those are all minor powers. You, I call them neutrals. I often refer to them as neutrals. But uh, really what they're referred to in here is minor powers. So you see all of those ones in there with the different colors and the, and the roundels on the board. Um, with those ones, I always put the roundels on the board. With the other ones, like you see the USSR there, the roundel is printed on, but I, I didn't place a roundel on there. So it's easy to, to see where all those are. Like over here in Mongolia, that's a, that's a minor power as well. And they also, if there's only one of them, like here, Saudi Arabia, then, then there's only one of them. But if there's more than that, then uh, when you look on the board here, there's Northern Iran, Southern Iran, and Azerbaijan. Um, usually one of them is the capital, right? Um, and it's not always clear which one it is. Obviously with Portugal, Portugal is the capital, but you can see it has many colonies as well. There's Portuguese roundels there and there and there. Uh, there's one over there. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, um, these minor powers are, like this isn't a minor power here. This is part of Portugal. So there's that as well, right? Anyway, let's get on to the, to the next part. Now this game is, is actually a bit complicated um, if you start in the 1936 scenario. That's where you find most of the complications. Um, if you're starting in the 1939 scenario where some of the nations are already at war, then it's actually pretty easy. And in fact, once the game gets going, like say you're in 1942 or 43, once the Americans and the Italians are in, then it's actually quite easy. Uh, the the um, it, it's, uh, it's all about aligning after that. But before that, in the pre-war era, that's where you find a lot of, of uh, alignment versus control issues. Um, if you're using the diplomacy expansion, that kind of takes away from all of these rules. Um, I kind of like playing it uh, without the diplomacy expansion and with like it's just a different game like it's a completely different game without the diplomacy expansion um, there's certain conditions that have to be met and certain nations um, align in different ways to, to different nations uh, but you'll see that like it'll be in in the rule book in, in section four um, about the political situation there's tables in there that tell you what, what aligns to who and everything. For the most part, most nations, if you attack them, their colonies would align to either Germany or Britain. Like if Germany attacks this one, for instance, let me just grab a roundel here. So if Germany was to take this one out here, like let's say they occupy it and everything. Pretend we have a German guy on there. So if Germany was to take this out, then, um, then you um, the rest would be uh, would go to the British or would it depends uh, we know that Turkey is now at war with Germany we have to ask ourselves is Great Britain at war with Germany so if you're only in 1937 the answer is probably no you know 37 38 39 like Britain is trying to get itself to wartime income um, so that it can be at war uh, but let's assume for right now that it's in 1937 and uh, and Germany has taken that out, then what what that means is that these other units, so there's the boat here, there's a boat over here that belongs to Turkey, there's these three units here, there's these two units here, those uh, will still be under the Turkish flag like they are right now, but they will be controlled by Great Britain. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, so it, it, it's, it, it just refers to a limited level of decision making that you have over a non-aligned power. So, uh, uh, like here, um, let me just pick up, can I bring us. So, if you control a, a minor power, the major power may uh, move the minor power's units, including combat movement, if already at war, make a recruitment roll on a D12, um, um, but what you can't do is declare war or take actions that put that minor power at war with any other major or minor power. You can't collect income from it. 
you can't lend lease from it, you can't re research technology for it, you can't engage in diplomacy if you are using the diplomacy expansion. So really what you can do is you can fight against the Germans if you want. Like you could move these units around and you could fight Germany because that's the only nation you're already at war with. Uh, you wouldn't be able to declare a war on, on um, uh, Iran, for instance. Now, remember, this is just a vanilla game here. We're not talking about if you're using the Turkey at war expansion, okay? Uh, so, uh, Germany collects this two bucks. Nobody collects these out of the money. What'll happen is, uh, on the British turn, the British will take their turn, and then they will count up the number of territories. In this case, it's two that they control. So they will get the D12, and they will roll it, and they'll try to get a two or less. If they do get a two or less, then they have a choice. They can either put one infantry on there, and then we're talking about regular infantry, or two militia. And that's the only thing you can do. You don't collect the money, you don't spend the money. That was something that they had in version two. They wanted to um, simplify it so that all the minor powers work, to work the same way like that. Like this is what you do with the Spanish Civil War and, and what you do in, in China, right? Is, um, is the recruitment role. I'm, I'm speaking specifically of the CCP. Uh, the KMT does collect money, but they're kind of special cases. Uh, China, uh, Communist China, and Free France, they're a little bit different than everybody else. This is how most of them are going to work, is what I'm showing you here. So yeah, they can, they, can, they can attack Germany, but they can't attack anybody else. Um, and uh, that's about it here. Let me just get to the next part. Okay, so that was control. Now, uh, uh, for alignment, uh, now remember, we're still, uh, we were talking about pre-war here, and Great Britain is not yet at war with Germany, but Turkey is. Now let's say uh, this happened just the, the, the term before. So um, the, the Germans uh, didn't have time to, to take over the rest. They, they probably wouldn't have attacked that unless they could have taken it out uh, eventually, right? But let's say the, the Great Britain does go to war now. So Britain is at war, and then uh, what will happen is, you would take off the roundels from Turkey uh, um, and then you would place the British roundels on and you would add up their income. So this is an income of one. You would also take all their units off. You would replace their units with British units. So you would put a British artillery down, you would put, put a British uh, plane down, a British mountain infantry, uh, British battle cruiser. Like you would, you would replace all of these with British units, right? Um, and that's, uh, that's how you would align them. Um, and then they would they would uh, move and fight as if they were British, like they are British now. You know what I mean? They're they're not uh, some some something you control. They are a part of you now. And and so to define that, um, two nations that are control like uh, a nation that is controlled by you. If uh, you both go to war with the same power, in this case Germany, then you become aligned. And it's the same with major nations as well. Like France and, and the UK don't start out in 1936 as a line. So before you're aligned, you can't stop on each other's territory. Like you couldn't fly um, a, a British plane over to Paris and land there. You wouldn't be allowed to. You could, and this isn't in the, the beta rules, by the way, but you could use the railway. We talked about that in my Abyssinia video. You, you could use the railway here, but uh, the French unit wouldn't be able to stop in, in the British territory. He'd have to keep going, so he's got to build a railway here, and then you would you would be able to use it with the Berman, the British uh, players' permission. Um, but normally you couldn't fly over them, you couldn't land on them, um, because you're you're not part of the same alliance until you're at war with the same power. That's the same with two major powers or a major power and a minor power. That's the difference between a control and alignment. Um, so let's just get to the next part. Now who to decide, how do you decide who gets to control or align things? Um, like I said, for the most part, it either goes British or it goes German, but not always. So what you would do um, in case of, um, let's just talk about everybody else first, the, the ones where there's just a few of them. So if it happens in North or South America over there, and one a member of the Axis or the common turn attacks one of those things, like Brazil, perhaps, then it will uh, be controlled or aligned by the Americans, depending on whether or not the Americans are at war with the same power that attacked 
that minor power, okay? So that's there. Uh, with, um, with Republican Spain and with Mongolia, if one of those um, places are attacked by a major power, then they would align to the USSR. If somebody attacked Siam here, that's this roundel right here. If somebody were to attack Siam, then they would align to the uh, to the Japanese. Like you, you got to remember, even if somebody was to take that over, you got to remember there's the boats, right? So uh, Japan would get this boat right here. They wouldn't get any other land territories, but they would get that boat. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, everything else on the board goes to either Germany or the Commonwealth. Now I say the Commonwealth because um, it, what you would do um, if either Russia or a member of the Allies attack something, and it's unlikely that the Allies because will attack because they get a big penalty for doing that. But if that happens, then that minor power would align to Germany. So all over the board, um, if the Allies attack those nations, except for Siam uh, and Mongolia and Republic of Spain, they would go to the Germans. Now, when you're deciding the other way, when um, when a member of the Axis attacks a minor power, then it goes to the Commonwealth. And you would decide what nation to give it to based upon who, uh, which faction was the closest. Like it's probably not going to be the Anzac, right? Like I guess, uh, where's the nearest one? Right here. So if somebody attacked this one, then sure, then Anzac would get it, but that's about the only one. Uh, if somebody were to attack, say, oops, I sat that down on somebody. Are you dizzy yet? So like if, uh, if somebody were to attack Azerbaijan up here, then um, like say the Germans were to attack that, then these two uh, factions here would be controlled by and eventually aligned to, uh, if they were at, uh, at war with the Commonwealth, the FEC, because the FEC is the closest land zone to those territories. Now with Turkey here, you can see that Transjordan is the closest one, and that's, that is a, 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 a UK territory, a British territory. So that's why we would put the, the UK roundels on up there. And for anybody, like most of the neutrals are, are up there, right? Uh, either in South America or in uh, Europe. So just about everything would go with the British. There's only a couple of them uh, that would go to the FEC. Uh, so for the most part, it's either gonna be Germany or Great Britain that aligns to those or is controlled by those. So I mentioned my video yesterday that I made, it was called the Dutch Panic Cook, that, uh, that these guys here, um, the, the Japanese came down here and I encourage you to go watch that video if you haven't seen it. These guys came down and took out um, just about all of the Dutch islands down here. They didn't bother with this one because uh, because it it it, uh, it wasn't worth anything. Like it's not worth any money. And they did not uh, they did um, miss this boat in here, uh, this uh, submarine. So other than that, they wiped out the Dutch, right? Um, and what I was saying at the time uh, was that uh, now they couldn't go back and, and do it again. Um, because then they would be attacking the British, but that was wrong. See, I was thinking that uh, that this was a special case, the the uh, the Netherlands East Indies, and that it would go to the British on the second time. But that's not true. That's not correct. I made a mistake there. I just didn't want to redo an hour long video. Okay. So what happens is like that. It was still a just. It was a, the second. It was only the third turn of the game. So you're still in 1937. These, uh, this boat here is controlled by the British. And then you've got the orange guys up there. There's, there's uh, two dudes and two boats up there. That's the capital of the Netherlands. They're controlled by the British. And that's it, the, they just control them. Um, they, don't, uh, they, they don't get the income from them. So if Japan wanted to, on the next turn, they could attack this thing. They could attack this one, one down here. Um, Germany could attack the Netherlands up there if they wanted to, you know, like they'll probably want to do that before the British can take that over. So it depends on how far along Britain is to uh, getting it to declare war, right? 
um, probably in the turn that Germany declares war on both of them, they might want to take that out. Otherwise, uh, you know, the two dudes is not that big a deal, but the two boats, you don't want to make the British fleet any bigger than it already is, right? But anyway, sorry about that for making that mistake. One of the problems is, and I was talking with my friend Morton from Denmark about this, is, uh, you know, like I've been through about three or four versions of this game now. Uh, and the rules keep changing, right? Like version two rules, uh, I learned those first. And then this is probably the third or fourth iteration of these rules that I've been through um, until we've got to this point where the rules are, are ready to put, be put out and everything. He's saying he's even more confused because like he's heavily involved in play testing and everything. And so he's the one that comes up with new rules and stuff like that and changes rules. So, you know, he'll tell me a rule like he just did yesterday and uh, he'll, he'll get, get back to me, hey, uh, I forgot that that was no, that was something we were we were doing before. It's not anymore. Just uh, you know, like somebody commented on one of my videos yesterday, something to do with Japanese having first strike in in jungle. That was a, a rule that was part of uh, version three last summer when Doug put out the rules for people to take a look at and to make suggestions. That's not part of the rules in the end. It's just part of the rules from last summer. So we we've been going through these, me and and the other designers. You know, and so our, our brains are kind of jumbled around. Like, is this a rule anymore? Is that a rule? Like, we have to go back and read the rule book again because uh, because uh, we can't remember. Was that still or, you know? But anyway, that was a basic mistake that I made. Like, that was what I was talking about, you know, with the rule book and the reference sheets. You need to know the basics. And the basics between the basics of alignment and control is that the, um, the British are not yet at war with Japan or a major power for that matter. And so therefore, you only control these territories. You don't get to collect income from them. You don't get to put your roundel on them. Like this stays a Dutch roundel. Those guys stay Dutch over there. They don't become British. Not until Great Britain goes to war, then you switch them. So that, that's a mistake that I made. Another mistake that I made in that video was, um, I thought that maybe the Chinese could attack that guy uh, up there so I put these things here you know what I would have done that anyway because I had nowhere else to put them I mean nobody can attack Japan right but I had nowhere else to put those guys but uh, China can't attack you until they be one of them becomes a major power they're not allowed to attack anybody so um, basically you were safe there you could have left nothing up there if you wanted but I'm, I was thinking ahead as well you know I was thinking that I might want to go back to China so it's not a bad idea putting those there anyway uh, Russia couldn't attack, so, you know, uh, but anyway, I got that one wrong, too. <laughs> and it's, I tell you, it's easy. I research these things, like, to the nth degree. I, I, I go through, like, ten different uh, scenarios and things and reference sheets and, you know, like, looking at everything before I make a video. And then you start making a video, and then you get to a certain spot, and you think, oh, I didn't look that part up. <laughs> so, you know, um, so it's easy to make mistakes. And, and I know how easy it is for you to make mistakes as well. So don't worry about it. You're going to make mistakes. But that's why you should read the book. That's why you should encourage all your the people in your group to read the rule book. Because it could be that they catch something that you don't catch. And then, you know, like you don't have to go outside and have a fist fight over it. You can just, okay, show me where that is. And then the person shows you, oh, okay, yeah, there you go, right on. Now we know the rule. <laughs> just remember, though, that there's always somewhere else in the book that says, except... You know, and, and so, you know, like, <laughs> like in the case of these uh, minor powers here, um, there's a lot of special alignment conditions with Poland and Sweden and, and Finland and, uh, you know, like a lot of different things in Germany, right? Germany that, that uh, takes over the, that's why I made all these ones white down here, all these different nations is because they all eventually go to Germany, um, probably, you know, not necessarily, but probably, uh, but anyway. <laughs> Like uh, I'm not going to go through all those though because uh, this isn't um, this isn't my video rule book. This is just going through some of the the misunderstood ones. So anyway, really read that hard and get it through your skull. What, the difference between control and alignment. Control is uh, is the nation that takes over for a minor power, um, but doesn't collect for them and doesn't switch the units. Alignment is when you go ahead and you switch all those units and you start integrating them into your army and collecting the money for those lands. And so find out what the cases are. Basically what it is 
is if you're both at war, that minor power and you as that major power are both at war with the same major power. Not minor power, <laughs> major power. Anyway, let's get to the next rule. Another thing that I see quite often and, and really heated dis disagreements over, um, big time disagreements over, and that is the term immediacy. immediacy. So 5.3 5, immediacy in the rule book, it says income increases, income increases occur immediately, even though the income itself is not collected until the player's turn. Thus, a player may be able to take income dependent actions like declaring war even on another player's turn. Um, so you need to understand that, right? Uh, that's something in itself. But what you also need to understand is that that doesn't mean uh, everything. Like some people take immediacy everywhere. Let me tell you something uh, like uh, an example of that. So let's say that Great Britain is at war, okay? Um, let's say that uh, uh, then uh, the UK, or so then, um, Japan came down. Let's say it's, it's 1941 and Japan comes down here and does what they did in my video there yesterday where they take all of these islands down here. Um, um, except for maybe they, they failed to take one of them out or something. And so what happens is, like let's say they, they didn't get this one here, okay? What happens in this case then is that... Uh, this becomes British. So you put a British roundel here, a British roundel here, you would replace this with a, with a British ship. But people think that you would do that right away, right? Uh, they, they take immediacy too far. Um, what, what they're thinking is, so uh, like uh, the, there was uh, Dutch ships here, right? So what they're thinking is as soon as the, the Japanese attack the Dutch ship here, well now all of this stuff becomes British. Right? All of it becomes British because you've attacked the Dutch ships. So now you're attacking Britain and there's big consequences for that, right? Uh, namely, 5D12 for the Americans plus the D12 for attacking, there's 2D12 for attacking the Dutch ships. So we're talking 7D12 here that the Americans would get to add to their income uh, by going... <laughs> by going with that, like, uh, for one thing, I mean, come on guys, like this completely breaks the spirit of the rules, right? Uh, j just think about this for a second. D do you think that's what they meant to do? No. Um, anyway, so I've had them clarify that because uh, I've seen arguments online and, and, uh, and I've talked to them about it. I said, listen, you're gonna need to, I know what you, might, what you mean, uh, but you need to state that right on. And so they did. Um, so what happens here is that Rather than these all becoming British, as soon as you attack the Dutch boats or attack one Dutch land zone and then all the rest become Britain, that doesn't happen immediately. What you have to do is you have to wait for that action to finish. In other words, um, you have to wait for the combat phase to be over. So once Japan, or, yeah, once Japan has finished um, rolling all their combat and taking the land zones and putting the 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 flags on, uh, once that's done, when they're about to start non-combat moving, that's when the other things, that's when the consequences can come to pass. Okay, so that's when you would put the British roundel here. That's when you would change the, the sub here to a British sub. That's when you would do the two, uh, two D12 for the Americans. That's when you would change everybody else's income, three for the FEC, or two for the FEC, two for the British, three for Anzac, one for France. That's when you would do those things. You have to wait until the end of the contact, uh, the end of the turn. To, like people, they seem to get this immediacy um, thing in their brain. They knew they read immediacy somewhere in the rule books and it means that, that you take action right away. That's not what they meant. It's what they meant is exactly what I read to you. Um, it's about the income. Uh, the player's income goes up, but it doesn't take effect yet. Uh, or sorry, the, uh, the the effects of that, like the British, um, sorry, you have to wait till the end of that turn. I'm, I'm screwing myself up again. Anyway, you have to wait till the end of combat to do that. And that also came up when it came to, to something to do with China over here. In the last week or two, somebody was talking about that on accessanalyze.org there. They were saying that, uh, that, so in order to become a major power, 
either one of these factions have to get to, geez, what is it, 13? Here, I'm going to find out just a second. Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's 13. So um, if either one of these, uh, either the CCP or the KMT, reaches that threshold of having 13 IPP income, then uh, then they evolve to a major power. So somebody thought, ooh, I can, I can fuck with these rules, right? So what they thought is, um, because if... Uh, if you if you attack these guys, what will happen is that uh, all of the warlords will align to the KMT. So they thought, okay, when, when I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare war on the KMT with the Germans. And what that will do, if you add up all the territories, I think it, it's 14 IPP. Then he was going to attack with the Japanese. And then Japan will be able to take their bonuses, right? Uh, because Japan doesn't get any of the bonuses. You know, like the bonuses for having, um, there's some territories here on the coast uh, they get bonus money for, but only if they're at war with, with a major power. They don't get those bonuses while they're at war with just simply a minor power like China. So the guy was trying to break the spirit of the rules, and I don't blame him. Like, I mean, uh, you try to do whatever you can, right? But but really, I mean, <laughs> think about it. Is that what, they were, what the spirit of that rule really was? Anyway, so I read, 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 and they're going to change uh, the wording uh, um, so that people will, will understand it more clearly. What it did say, though, uh, what I did find and what it did say was that um, it's only if you attack the KMT, not if you declare war on them. It's if you attack China, then you have to also, like I said before with the Dutch, you have to wait till the end of the combat phase because you know like if you just attack the first one and it's only worth one IPP then the rest of them are 13 IPPs hey immediacy says I'm at 13 I'm a major power right no it doesn't <laughs> you have to wait till the end of that action you have to wait till the end of combat but be aware of that so if you're the Japanese don't just attack one territory that's worth one because you will turn the KMT into a major power and then um, that uh, that they can start building complexes and or yeah they, they can build themselves a complex and they will be tougher after that. Uh, it's not a it's not just great because all of a sudden you get a couple of bonus points. There's only a couple of bonus points there that you can get. You know like you, you're going to make them tougher because they're a major power. But anyway, just be aware of that. You want to take more than one IPP off of uh, KMT or a warlord. Uh, before you stop attacking them. You want to take at least two or three off them um, before uh, before you stop on the first time you attack China. But but anyway, that's, uh, that's again to do with the immediacy, right? It doesn't mean you immediately, as soon as the guy walks in there and says, okay, and then, hey, wait a minute, I'm a major power, your dice didn't drop yet. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Quit dicking around. Anyway. That's another thing that people are misunderstanding. Let's get to the next one. Okay, so this one's really quick and really simple, really basic. There's a, a FAQ, FAQ, um, on the Global War website that, um, that states a few things. You know, like uh, um, one of the things it states is that Italy's supposed to get a transport if you play with the Spanish Civil War expansion set. And there's a few other things on the FAQ, right? Um, frequently asked questions and um, that uh, that's for version 2 okay <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't translate to version 3 the Italians in this game are more powerful they've got an increase in their in their peacetime income of 3 IPP which could be you know that could be 21 24 27 30 IPP before you go to war that's how much more they get they do not get a free transport don't let you or your friends um, be putting a, a transport in when you play in version 3. They don't get a free transport, okay? It's that simple. The last thing I want to talk about is China. Um, you need to, to read the rules on China that are in the, uh, the Chinese Civil War. It's near the back of the, the rule book and uh, there's a little bit in the um, in the you know the alignment control area there plus there's all the stuff that is on both of the national reference sheets this both the CCP and the KMT, KMT national reference sheets because 
the rules have changed regarding China and uh, I'm not going to give you a whole tutorial on it uh, I just want you to know that the rules have changed probably the biggest change is that uh, is the relationship between the two the Civil War would be much more interesting if you choose to, to fight a civil war um, so the CCP can can influence the warlords now but they have to be touching that warlord like here uh, there, there's um, there's two groups of warlords so this is one of them right here these three here are one warlord and there's another one there let me see which one that is uh, uh, Hainan and Sinkang so those are down south there uh, I think the um, is this one no that's Shantung uh, okay this one here and Hainan um, that's the island really let me see that again yeah that's what it says Hainan and Sinkang it says they're, they're, they're grouped together but to the same warlord so if you were to influence one of them then um, then like with an, with an influence role, then you get them both, right? And if you were to influence, say, this one here, then you get all three of these, plus you get the units that are in them, right? So without even going to war, you can make the CCC or CCP bigger by doing that. Um, if the CCP were to attack one of these ones, then these two warlords would come under the, these two uh, would come under the control of the KMT. So anyway, I'm not gonna go through China too much, I just want you to know that the rules regarding China are changed and they're much better. Uh, they're, they're much more interesting. Before they were kind of boring, you know. Uh, I didn't put any stock into the Chinese Civil War. I just thought, you know what, let's just pile up as much crap as we can. Here comes the Japanese, right? And so uh, that's all I did because I didn't see any point in fighting with each other. Um, but you never know, like it could happen. Like if Japan does something like that down there and they decide to keep going, well, then, you know, you might as well just go after each other, right? Um, as long as you're sure Japan's not coming back any anytime soon. So anyway, check those rules out regarding the civil war in China because they it has changed a lot. Probably the rule that I see that causes the most confusion is the one regard the ones that regarding uh, convoying and submarines. Um, it's pretty complicated in this game. How the convoying happens and really the relationship between submarines and all of the other boats on the board and planes uh, it's really quite a complex relationship now I don't think I'm going to get to that in this video because that in itself would uh, I think would require its own video and I'd kind of like to do a strategy video to do with that so I think what I might do is uh, over sometime in the next week here um, I like them this is the last day of my holiday uh, the the uh, the spring offensive was supposed to be winding up right about now and uh, I'm declaring victory because nobody else showed up so uh, I win thank you thank you very much uh, where's my trophy anyway uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to do a video about the uh, the uh, the battle in the Atlantic and so I'm gonna take a look at both sides of them. I'm not gonna say okay if you're the British do this I'm I'm gonna say okay this is what the war in the Atlantic is gonna look like if you're British you'll want to do this if you're German you'll want to do this and uh, it, while I'm doing that, I'll be going through the video, or sorry, through the uh, uh, the rules on on you know how to do it right. Uh, so like you'll get a better sense of what the new rules are regarding convoy rating, and there's a lot of them, uh, an awful lot of them, and they they did evolve a, a lot over the last year. You know, like uh, when I seen them a year ago, they're nothing like they were then. Um, some of the changes have stuck. And some of the changes haven't and so I, I don't want to do that in this video I think it deserves its own video and that's all I got for you today my second video of the day on the last day of my holidays so take care everyone general hangar nade out